We believe in prayer. We believe in the altars. Can someone say amen to that? You know, I was watching, you know, um, a service, and, and God does things in different ways, and um, and it was a beautiful service, and I got nothing, you know, really negative to say, and it was, but the word program came to my mind, and I, how many of you know there's times where you can go to church, and there's a program, but there's not the presence, can someone say amen, and nothing wrong with having a program, but how many of you know a, a program uh, won't deliver you, can, can someone say amen, <clears throat> and so I thank God for His presence here this morning, and uh, we're not. I'm gonna want to. I want to get straight into this word this morning. You know, uh, I felt like the Lord gave me uh, a word last night to share with us. And you know, uh, we joke around how you know uh, when Precious Tiari or Heather preach, <clears throat> the Lord always confirms things, and I still want God to confirm my 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 messages. And maybe you know, but <clears throat> there's times this morning I said, Lord. Whether you confirm it or not, I'm just going to preach it. Can someone say amen? Because if sometimes if you're looking, you know, it's okay to have a confirmation, but sometimes you just got to know that you know that you've heard from the Lord. So I didn't ask for a confirmation, but the Lord confirmed it anyway. Can you put the first slide of the first song that <clears throat> you guys led us in this morning? And so the first sentence in my <clears throat> the next, uh, next words... Next, 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 is this this, it, okay, right here, you can stop right here. <clears throat> so this is the first song that they did, and I don't know, it's just one of my deals, I don't really like to let <clears throat> anybody know what I'm preaching, because it can change at any time, and so my wife doesn't even know what I'm going to preach, <clears throat> and it's interesting that this is the first song and these words jumped out at me because the words in, in this song is the first words in my first sentence that I want to share with you guys this morning. The Bible says, let everything be established by two or three witnesses. And I believe God is stamping this this morning. So thank you for being here. And I don't want to abuse your time. Uh, pray for me that I'll deliver his word. Uh, it's, not, it's not something new. It's something basic. Uh, but I feel it's a reminder for me. <clears throat> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to speak. Father, we're not here by accident, Lord God. And we thank you that we serve a God who's not a mute idol or a wooden carven image. But, Father God, we serve a living God who still speaks today. Your word in John 10, 10 says, The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you have, might have life and life more abundantly. And we serve the great shepherd, a good shepherd this morning. And he said that my sheep know my voice, no other will they follow. This morning, God, I ask by the Holy Spirit that you silence every voice that is not of you. God, the voice of our flesh, the, the voice of our offenses, the voice of our hurts, secular voices, Lord God. God, you said that your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit. God, I pray that anything that is of soul, Lord God, our mind, will, emotions, Lord God, will be cut to the side, and only that which is spirit will come through. Father God, time is short. Eternity is ahead of us. God, you said that we must make the most of every opportunity for the days of our evil that we should discern the will of God for our lives. So help me preach, Lord God. Help me to teach, not just to your children, your people, but to myself as well. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody say amen. We'll be going to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, <clears throat> if you study Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, Jeremiah was raised as a prophet in, in a time frame where all of Israel were backslidden. All of Israel turned their back. Just imagine the whole entire uh, <clears throat> kingdom of God today just turned their back and were backslidden. Jesus does talk about the last days there will be a great falling away. And it seems many have just laid down their convictions and laid down their faith um, <clears throat> to serve mammon. 
to serve money, to serve their own selfish desires. <clears throat> and there are times where in the midst of Israel's backsliding state, God would raise up certain men and women of God. Can someone say amen? Now look at your neighbor and say, that might be you. Okay, now, now look at your neighbor and start prophesying to your neighbor and says, that might be you. Okay, you guys really hesitated on that. <clears throat> but how many of you know that the Lord, the Bible says that unless the trumpet sound is clear, the soldiers won't know what to do. In this day and hour, many are running to and fro. The government, the schools, everywhere you go, they don't know what to do. Maybe because the Christians are silent. Where are the prophets? Where is the word of the Lord? <clears throat> and so God had to raise up Jeremiah in the midst of Israel's backslidden state. And they threw him in, uh, uh, they threw him in empty wells. They threw him in. They beat him. They hated him. Nobody liked him. How many of you know today, if you look at preachers, they're, they're celebrated. But back in the Old Testament, they were crucified. Come on, somebody, help me preach this morning. The Bible says that in the last days, people will look for preachers that will tell them what their itching ears want to hear, not what their dying souls need to hear. Can someone say amen? It's interesting that Jesus was the greatest preacher, yet his own did not receive him. They crucified him. They mocked him. They did not receive his message. It's interesting that today that the messages from pulpits today are just so well and easily digestible. <clears throat> For me, I need to hear, I need to hear God's word. That I can't survive off of cotton candy. I can't survive off a of sugar diet. Amen? Every once in a while, it's good. But how many of you know <clears throat> if you, if you want to have a healthy body, you need more than that, where we move from milk to steak. And I'm not saying that it's a steak message, but <clears throat> it's just that the, the, the nature of the call of God <clears throat> on Jeremiah to raise him up to prophesy. <clears throat> the title of my message is Destiny Calls and Potential Cries Out. Destiny Calls, you can write down, and Potential Cries Out. That your destiny is calling out to you and I. Your, your potential is crying out for us, for the sons and daughters to be released, <clears throat> to be seen on the earth. Mark Batterson in his book called Soul Print said that we all have a unique fingerprint, but it is only skin deep. <clears throat> Everybody look at your finger. There's no one exact fingerprint, we, even if you're a twin. Everybody have a distinct, everybody say distinct. Everybody has a distinct fingerprint. <clears throat> Mark Batterson in his book, Soul Print, said that we all have a unique fingerprint. <clears throat> but it is only skin deep. But we all have a soul print. S-O-U-L, soul print. Which is even deeper And that soul print is not <clears throat> who we are in the present but who we are to become in the future. Can you put those words up again? <clears throat> so it's it, the soul print. The soul print in each and every one of us is like our spiritual DNA. It is even deeper than the fingerprint. The soul print is not who we are in the present, but who we are to become in the future. <clears throat> God of my present and God of my future. Can someone say amen? How many of you, some of us, we make mistakes all the time. We, 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 we have a, 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 a bad past for some of us, and we make mistakes yesterday. And, but their soul print is not who we are in the present, but who we are to become in the future. <clears throat> and so the blemishes that you see on your spouse today, how many of you know, is not judgment. Come on, somebody. We're all in process that he's also a God of our future. If God would have selected David based on his present, he would never be a king in the future. Can someone say amen? A man who was adulterer, who, who committed murder. Come on, somebody. 
If God judged you on your present, come on somebody, like a lot of people want to do, like if you make a mistake, you're done, you're over with, I thank God that I serve a merciful God. Can some of them say amen? That who's not going to give up on you for what you did yesterday, but he has a destiny for you tomorrow. Can someone say amen? Don't let anybody hold you down. Come on somebody. Jesus died to set you free. <clears throat> no matter how much you're persecuted at work, at school, or maybe even your, uh, <clears throat> your family member, it doesn't really matter. If you have an unsaved loved one, how many of you know we need to know our soul print? We need to know our destiny. Destiny calls out. Can someone say amen? What is your destiny? <clears throat> so our soul print is <clears throat> something that God imprints on our heart. You know, uh, work here, I work up here at the school, and I was talking to a new staff member. And when I say this, I'm not saying look at me. I'm just saying, you know, uh, uh, if I'm going to go somewhere to work, I'm just saying, Lord, I'm praying God, use me somehow. I don't want to just go to work just to make money. Come on, somebody. If you're just going to work a nine-to-five job, that's boring. Uh, Jesus died for more than just going nine-to-five. Can someone say amen? <clears throat> I said, Lord, just use me. In, in, in spite of me, use me. <clears throat> yes, I'm there to work. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm there to you know, uh, 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 work for the Lord, but I want to look for opportunities. And I had my pastor friends pray one day, and I said, the, I feel like the Lord is highlighting this certain uh, a staff member that I'm supposed to witness to this certain staff member. And I told my pastor friends, can you pray for this guy? And they said, yes, we will. The very next day I went to work, and I'm way behind the tennis court by the basketball court. And that certain person that my pastor friend that we prayed for walked across campus and came right up to me and started asking some spiritual questions. Can someone say amen? And I began to <clears throat> uh, share the word of the Lord with him. And, didn't, and, and he, you know, he's in his 30s, and I found out that, you know, he knew the Lord when he was nine, but he's been backslidden ever since. Come on, somebody. Guys, there's opportunities all over the place. <clears throat> and I was able to give him a devotional. But it didn't end there. The bell rang. School was over. He came back into my room and began to ask and, and, and ask me questions. And he said, I can't believe that you prayed for me yesterday. And so just yesterday, I, I was faced with such a depressing situation that I didn't know how I was going to get out of it. And it's so interesting that you guys prayed for me. Thank you for praying for me. How many of you know I didn't just overwhelm him with the gospel, but that is a huge seed already sowed in his heart. Can someone say amen? Somebody might water it. All I know is that, man, I said, the Lord is hot on your track right now. You're driving all the way from Hilo to work here, and somehow you would just <clears throat> stumble across a pastor and it doesn't matter that i'm passionate and you know you don't know and actually quite honestly and it's just regina you're making a difference because you know I, I didn't tell the guy i was a pastor you know i don't go around saying i'm a pastor I, it, it's not about the title i'm just a child of god but you know i was trying to befriend him the, for for a couple of days and after about a week he came to he oh pastor troy like oh how you know oh yeah sister regina told me you're a pastor <laughs> <coughs> But how many of you know that opened a door for ministry? Can someone say amen? And not only that, that they sees living the life there at the school. Can someone say amen to that? <clears throat> so I was talking to this new guy, and he said, I heard you're a pastor. He said, I always wanted to be a pastor. <clears throat> and, for, and I told him, not me. <laughs> I didn't choose to be a pastor. God chose me. Then in my stubbornness, I eventually have to surrender and then choose the call. And so it's not, our, our soul print, our spiritual DNA, <clears throat> our calling is not something that we just choose. I think I want to do this, I want to do that. Mark Bradison uses the word soul print. I'd like to call it an imprint, an imprint. In 1994, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I also had a vision <clears throat> of myself preaching. I never, I never wanted to be a preacher. I'm not saying that I'm not thankful I am today, but I'm just saying it's not something that was in my peripheral. It wasn't anything that I desired. But when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> I had a vision of myself preaching. It was an inner vision, or you could call it an impression. You ever hear that word impression? I, that people get impressions in their spirit? 
To me, it was God's imprint of who I was <clears throat> created to be and called to do. It was His destiny for my life. No matter where I went, that imprint went with me whether I liked it or not. Even in my backslidden state, even after being filled with the Holy Spirit. Anybody ever backslide before? Raise your hand. Okay, the rest of you, please pray for us. I'm just saying, in, in, in my backslidden state, I, f I remember I found myself um, in, in the club uh, and realizing that, you know what, where, where I go, uh, my calling goes. Where I go, my destiny goes. And even in my backslidden state, how many of you know the imprint is still within us? Can someone say amen? Talk to Jonah if you want to. <laughs> God gave him a word, even though he went to the opposite direction. His destiny or his destination was still within him. Let me say this just to save you guys a lot of time. You can't run from God. Can someone say amen? You're, gonna, you're only going to get tired. <laughs> Talk to Jacob. He wrestled with God and he thought he could win. But how many of you know all, all God had to do is just touch the, his hip and boom, socket dislocated. <laughs> Basically saying, I'm God and you're not. Can someone say amen? The easiest thing for us to do is just stop trying to be God in our lives. He knows us better than we know ourselves. <clears throat> so this spiritual soul imprint, destiny calls out. So it, as we're talking this morning, I want all of us just to begin to think in our, in our mind right now, uh, what is your destiny? Are you going after your destiny? Your potential is crying out. <clears throat> and you see for Jeremiah... God called him and God anointed him to be a prophet. There are so many times where he could have easily said, no, God, this is too hard. Anybody been there? I'm gonna raise, I could raise two hands and my leg. And it, I mean, there is, but it's not how I feel. It's not the direction I want to do, but God's calling. <clears throat> so it's kind of like a spiritual tattoo on your soul and in your spirit that you cannot erase. I have to be honest, there's one time, I, I mean, I just knew, I mean, I'd go to service and the prophet would call me out and says, you're called to the ministry, aren't you? And I was like, I mean, I had so many prophets tell me that after a certain point, I was like, man, you know, I mean, I just knew that I knew that I was called. And there was one time that I, I despised my calling. Just like Esau, he despised his birthright. Come on, somebody, help me preach this morning. He despised his birthright, and he instead settled for the convenience of his flesh instead of the anointing and authority that he had in his birthright. And then he came back crying and wishing <clears throat> he could get his birthright back. But in, 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 and there's times where I despise my calling, and I try to erase it. But how many of you know when your calling, your destiny is written with the blood of the Lamb? Can someone say Amen. And that is something that is irrevocable and that you and I cannot erase. When God places that imprint on your soul, you cannot escape it. For you carry his call wherever you go. Destiny calls and potential cries out. <clears throat> the definition of imprint is this. It's a mark made by pressure, a mark or figure impressed or printed on something. Are you able to go back to the place where God marked you for eternity? If not, I ask that you continue to go after the Lord like Jacob and wrestle and wrestle with the Lord until your destiny is imprinted on your spirit. <clears throat> the printer, or another definition of imprint is the printer's name or address as indicated on any printed matter. You know, when God <clears throat> filled me and he, he stamped my soul uh, with my soul print, how many of you know he was basically imprinting on my spirit his name, his address, and his ownership over my life? Can someone say amen? <clears throat> Another definition of imprint is to impress a quality or character, or listen to this, or a distinguishing mark. Look, this was in 1994, and some of you are like, Pastor, you always talk about it. You know why? Because I can't ever forget about it. It was a distinguishing mark in my life. And if we don't let that <clears throat> imprint go deep in our soul, we'll, we'll have the world forget who God really is and what God can really do in our lives. <clears throat> 
Another definition of imprint is to fix firmly on the mind or memory. This imprint on our mind where God begins to, you remember um, with the, uh, the disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus and they didn't know that Jesus was with them and all of a sudden he revealed himself and he says, were our hearts not burning within us? That's what happened when we walk with Jesus in a certain intimate way. That were our hearts not burning with us, that man, in your private secret closet where he can come in and invade your space, but our hearts must be open and hungry to it. <clears throat> I love this definition, Brother Andrew, of the word imprint. It says this, to bestow as a kiss. To bestow as a kiss. That is an imprint. How many of you know when God comes down and stamps his soul print on your life, it's like a kiss from heaven. Can someone say amen? <clears throat> In 1994, the kiss of God came down and kissed my soul. And over 20 years since that moment, it has left an indelible mark on my soul. I remember vividly right now. I can even, I can feel it right now. The kiss of heaven on my soul. <clears throat> God left a distinguishing mark, an imprint on my heart. And listen to this. And I was marked from that day. I was marked from that day. And, and here's another confirmation. <clears throat> In my notes right here, I have hashtag God's imprints. And I have to remind myself, illustration, get some stamps. And, <clears throat> and so I don't have any stamps. <clears throat> so before I got to church, I told, I texted my daughter, said, can you find me some st stamps? And Aliyah, and I said, put it on my desk. And she, she puts this on my desk right here. Thank you, Aliyah. I haven't even opened it yet. And it says this, make your mark. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Make your mark. But I'm telling you and I this morning that we weren't gonna, we're not going to make a mark on this earth until we are marked by heaven. Can someone say Amen. Because we will try in our own way, in our own strength. Saul trying to make a mark on this earth. Come on, somebody. Until God marked him. And then his life, listen carefully, God apprehended and then redirected. Come on, somebody. <clears throat> he was marked. And it says that he began to preach the gospel fearlessly. Fearlessly. Why? Why? Because he was a mark. He had a visitation. He had a soul print on his heart. Make your mark. <clears throat> and so, and then so a, is a soul print is like this. Is that God <clears throat> from heaven with his blood, he comes down and he touches us in a certain way. And <clears throat> he stamps us. <clears throat> and he leaves a mark deep within our heart. He leaves a soul print. He leaves a soul print, a, a mark that cannot be erased. And so there's times where <clears throat> I can even try to backslide, and the Lord will constantly remind me of His goodness. You remember the, <clears throat> the prodigal son when he was experiencing all the goodness of his father? And he began to leave, and he began to look outside of the kingdom, and he thought he could get something better out there. And instead, he lost all of his money. He lost his dignity. He ended up in the pig pen. And how many of you know, I pray that there will be two marks. I have two marks on my life. I have the mark from heaven and I have a mark from hell. The times when we were backsliding, the times where we didn't know if we were going to make it another day, the times where you were either in jail or you're in, a, in a rehab center or you're about to lose your mind. Come on, somebody. Like a dog, we turned into his vomit. I pray that you remember that, Mark. Can someone say amen? The time when you wanted to shoot yourself, where you were vulnerable, where you were suicidal. Come on, somebody. Why would anyone want to go back to that way? Come on, somebody. <clears throat> there are two marks. <clears throat> but I know heaven's mark is much greater much sweeter. <clears throat> An impression, the definition of impression is a strong effect produced on the intellect, feelings, and conscience. Impression means the effect produced by an agency or influence. <clears throat> An impression is this, an image in the mind caused by something external to it. So what happens is God from out externally comes in <clears throat> and puts his soul print. He prints our hearts. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 
4 to 10 says this. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. <clears throat> Before you were born, I set you apart. Listen, no matter what I de you decide now, what I was deciding while I was in the military, how many of you know, until I encountered him, uh, I didn't know that before I was even born, God already had, had a plan for me. Can someone say amen? <clears throat> but too many times we just go with our own plan. And when I got filled with the Holy Spirit and saw myself preaching, I, was, I, I, I actually was like laughing. I said, there's no way I, there's, uh, this local Filipino boy from Hawaii preaching. That's not even in our family lineage. I don't even know how to speak English. I, I don't even want to stand in front of people. That's not even what I want. But how many know the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But then the more and more I fell in love with him and I delight myself in him. Come on, somebody. My heart's desire begins to change and begin to pick up his desires. Can someone say amen? <clears throat> and so it says here, before I formed you. Everybody say before. It's just crazy for me to think that Paul... Paul, even before you were born, God had a plan for your life. And it's, you know, <clears throat> like, and like he knows the plan. He knows the, the plan for our lives. And he's watching from heaven. And all the mistakes that we're making and this and that, it's like, man, I just wish they would turn to me and find out what I want for their lives. And, he, and, and, and in some respects, he allows a, a, a certain of that to, to take place like, like the prodigal son. Call it like tough love, right? <clears throat> and it says here, I set you apart. I pointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. So most people, when the call of God comes on their lives, be careful if they're just so hungry and desperate just to go out and make it happen to themselves. Most of the people that got called, the call was so huge that they ran from it. Can someone say amen? Not amen the fact that you're running from it, but it's like, man, when God called me to preach, I was like, this, this is ridiculous. There's no way. <clears throat> and then Jeremiah says, oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. <clears throat> Man, do, let me read this again. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Man, ima imagine if we all, you know, I mean, what is that movie? Is it uh, that, uh, that liar or whatever? Um, who played, who is, huh? Yeah, Jim Carrey. But he could only say what the truth. Is it liar, liar? How many of you know we'd be in trouble? <laughs> but these guys were biblical. They didn't sugarcoat it. You know, I mean, you know, a lot of times, you know, pastors and preachers get, get a bad rap when, when they start preaching. And it's like, oh, it's too harsh. I mean, Jesus was like, you whitewashed tombs, dead man's bones. Man, I need the grace to be able to preach like that. People, they, they start leaving and it's, they're going to find somebody to, to tell them, oh, no, you're beautiful in your sin. Man, I would never want, if I had cancer in my body and I, and I went to the hospital, I wouldn't want a doctor to say, oh, no, you look nice and healthy. And he looked at the x-rays and he knows, no, no, you're good. Wouldn't you want the doctor to tell you what was really going on in your body? Can someone say Amen. <clears throat> <clears throat> and he says, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. We got to be careful with this message because the Lord's going to put words in our mouth, and you're going to go to work and says, thus saith the Lord. No, no, don't do that. <clears throat> <clears throat> put my words in your mouth. So today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms, listen carefully, to uproot and tear down. How many of you know sometimes the prophetic word comes up to uproot certain things in our lives? Can someone say amen? 
If there's things in my life that is trying to take root, man, I thank God for the prophetic word to uproot it before it actually be, turns into a stronghold. <clears throat> it says to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. So the prophetic word sometimes comes and it uproots and, te- uproots and tears down, destroys and overthrows. But the final end is to build and to plant. It's to uh, uproot those things that are not of God and to plant those things which are. So before God formed you, he had an idea about you. Only stop and think about that. Before God formed you, he had an idea about you. <clears throat> God knows you better than you. Amen? God knows you better than you. And I, I'm guilty. We're all guilty. Is that, you know, when, you know, especially, you know, working at the school and, you know, we had to ask them, you know, um, the Choose Love program, gratitude, and there's one thing where they have to write down things that they want, and, and you know, all of them write, oh, I want more money, I want a nice car, and this and this. And many times we think we know what will satisfy us. But how many of you know <clears throat> God knows us better than we know ourselves? Amen? And only He knows what can really satisfy I wanted to be a pilot in the Air Force. I wanted to be <clears throat> in the military to become an officer. And that was my direction. <clears throat> and by the grace of God, he closed that door. Then I try, I took the test to be a fireman. I actually went and ran the course, huffing and puffing, didn't pass. The door was closed. I also tried to become a, a police officer, believe it or not. Took the test. That didn't go well either. Come on, somebody. <laughs> imagine this guy with a gun. You don't want to imagine that, all right? <laughs> but many times we're, <clears throat> we're pursuing different things, and you know, God closes the door because, you know what? He knows what our destiny is and what can make us happy and what can satisfy us more than we know. Can someone say amen? <clears throat> Psalm 139, verse 2 to 6 says, You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going in and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. That's God. He's familiar with all of our ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. See, God knows us more than we know ourselves. And if we turn to him and ask him, what is our destiny? What is our call? What is our purpose? <clears throat> so God is not a respecter of persons. If God can make clear the call of God and destiny for prophet Jeremiah, why can't he make the call and destiny clear for a Christian baker? A Christian politician, a Christian farmer, lawyer, realtor, chef, carpenter, pastor, evangelist. <clears throat> that he can make clear to us what our destiny is. <clears throat> you see, many times people feel like God is so distant. And I was reading a story of this youth pastor who's pa- youth pastor in Kauai. I never really heard of this, but they have this little, this thing called um, crab races. And they will go to the beach and they'll collect all these crabs. And then <clears throat> they will have this racing platform. And they will release the crabs. And the first crab that would cross the finish line would win. But when they release the crabs, the crabs would be going all over the place. One actually ran off the, uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the racetrack and ran onto the road and got run over by a car. I don't know why I ta- said that. But, <clears throat> but my point is God is not there like, okay, let's release humanity. And you're just running all over the place. And... Don't have any direction or destiny. Before he formed you, he knew you. <clears throat> and he appointed you to fulfill your destiny. Our lives are not, right? my point about this crab race is that our, our lives are not random. Our lives are not random. At first I thought it was. I thought maybe I can just pick this or pick that. See, I didn't know what I was born for until I was born again. Can someone say amen? I was born into this world, and I just thought, you know, the world was telling me, oh, you need to go to college, you need to do this, you need to do that. And they painted a picture of what success is like. But how many of you know, a lot of successful people, excuse my language, but are blowing their heads off. Because success, money, and worldly success does not satisfy. Can someone say amen? 
Somebody in this place might be having an aching heart because you know destiny is calling out. Your potential is crying out. Destiny calls. Your potential is crying out. Until we go in the direction of our destiny and our potential, we will never be fully satisfied. Can someone say amen? <clears throat> destiny is something that is to happen or has happened to a particular person or thing. Destiny in the dictionary says, the predetermined, usually inevitable or irresistible course of events. Destiny calls. Your destiny is something from heaven that is irresistible, that nothing else can ever really satisfy. Jeremiah 1.6 says, when destiny is revealed, we feel very small because God wants us to lean and depend on him to bring forth our destiny. You see, in a society which valued the wisdom of older people, in Jeremiah's case, he was young, Jeremiah might have felt unable to speak because society <clears throat> wouldn't really listen to him. But a lack of any natural qualification, and he lacked any natural qualification to lead or to interpret events for the whole nation. The Lord, however, anticipated Jeremiah's objection to his call he knew and appointed him before he was born. God already knew that Jeremiah would have some issues with a call when he was going to get called, but <clears throat> God appointed him anyway. This is an awesome reminder of God's foreknowledge and, and particularly of God's calling of an individual. It puts all natural and acquired qualifications to the side. Can someone say amen? Nothing, nothing wrong with <clears throat> trying to be qualified, but how many know if he calls you, he'll qualify you? Can someone say amen? Because quite honestly, David was the least qualified. He didn't have the birthright. He was the youngest, and he was hiding back there. But God has a way of calling and qualifying, and all we got to do is fulfill our destiny. <clears throat> the phrase, the word of the Lord came to him. In verse 4, it says, the word of the Lord came to him. The, the phrase, the word of the Lord came to him, is a typical way of speaking about someone's call. It shows how the prophetic mission was not sought by the person to whom it came. Rather, God chose the person for his purpose. His will, once revealed, required that Jeremiah yield himself wholly to the call and destiny. His whole life would be affected by it deeply. The Lord is well able to speak to you and I. Can someone say amen? He's not a respecter of persons. A lot of times we say, oh, Moses and, and Saul, they have all these great dramatic uh, uh, encounters with God. But the Lord is not a respecter of persons. The Lord is well able to speak. In Hosea 1.1, 1, 1, it says, The word of the Lord <clears throat> came to Hosea, son of Berea, during the reign of Uzziah. Joel 1.1 1, 1 says, the word of the Lord came to Joel, son of Pethuel. The word of the Lord came to Hosea. The word of the Lord came to Joel. The word of <clears throat> the Lord came to Jeremiah. In Ezekiel 1.3, it says, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. Has the word of the Lord come to you? And what did we do? What are we doing with that call? <clears throat> Micah 1.1 1, 1 says this, the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morsheth during the reigns of Jotham. Listen to this, that the word of the Lord came to this young prophet Micah during the reigns of Jotham. Interesting that everywhere you see the word of the Lord came, it says during a certain epoch or a certain time frame. <clears throat> In Micah's case, the word of the Lord came to Micah of Morsheth during the reigns of Jotham. If we pull back the pages and look at what was happening during Jotham's time, <clears throat> it says this. See, the word of the Lord came to him in a vision. Listen carefully. Supernatural sight and or supernatural hearing took place for Micah's call. Supernatural sight or supernatural hearing, making him the Lord's messenger. Listen, it says the invisible God becomes audible. The invisible God becomes audible that he speaks and he can speak <clears throat> and wants to speak to us if we we'll position ourselves to hear the call. See, Micah prophesied from the time of Jotham in 740 to 732 B.C. This is the time frame by which Micah received his call. And some of us are looking at where we're at today. All the crazy things that we're... That, Planet Earth has never seen before. 
forced vaccinations, pandemics and, <clears throat> you know, riots and all. I mean, and we think we live in a crazy world, but guess what? The Lord knew exactly what time frame you would be living. Can someone say amen? During the time of Jotham was when Micah's call came. But how many of you know, during the time of this pandemic is exactly when you were called and you were born into this earth. Can someone say amen? So Micah prophesied from the time of Jotham, 740 to 732 B.C., a period when the Neo-Assyrian Empire was rising to power. This is exactly when Michael received the call. It's when <clears throat> the Neo-Assyrian Empire was rising to power. How many of you know when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord raises a standard? Can someone say amen? When evil comes into America, how many of you know God is looking for men and women of God to call and to fill their mouths with the word of God? Can someone say amen? To go into the highways, byways, to go into the schools, to go into the, your offices, wherever it might be, Ocean View, Pahala. Amen? So it's not random. It's not just happenstance where we live or where we work. For such a time as this that God has called us, the determined Assyrian king, <clears throat> Tiglath III, launched Assyria on this uh, imperial expansion. They were pretty much taking over <clears throat> that region. He assaulted Israel's coastal plain, and they annexed northern Israel in 733 B.C. Another king, uh, Shalmaneser V, in 726 to 722, attacked Samaria, and, and Samaria fell to Sargon II. The invincible and cruel Assyrians invaded the area. The last <clears throat> proved most devastating to Judah. Listen carefully. Sennacherib from 704 to 681 captured all of Judah's foothill and fortifications. And <clears throat> the devil was taking over the whole region. That the devil may be taking over whole regions, whole states, maybe different churches or, or whatever it may be. And the devil is coming in like a flood. But it says only Jerusalem miraculously survived. Why? Because Hezekiah repented in response to me, Micah's preaching. Can someone say amen? That God might raise you and I up for such a time as this. That evil is so pronounced and taking over states and cities and churches. But God says, I'm going to put a call on this man of God or this woman of God. I'm going to put my words in their mouth so they'll speak the truth and pierce the darkness. And maybe, maybe somebody might repent. Maybe one city might be saved. Maybe one church might be saved. Come on, somebody. Can someone say amen? That our call comes with a cost, yes. But the cost, Brother Andrew and I were talking about, there's a cost for the call. But there's even a greater price and cost if we don't answer the call. Can someone say amen? If Micah did not fulfill his destiny, Hezekiah would not have repented and Jerusalem would have been captured. Come on, somebody. When God calls us, he's not playing with us. God's calling us because there's a deeper purpose. If you're called to be at the school, walk in there fully anointed, on fire, in humility, looking to make an impact because God has someone on his mind. Can someone say amen? <clears throat> if all of you know, yeah, well, uh, um, I love many of you know where my 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 classroom is, <clears throat> but um, it's it's room twenty one as you as you uh, walk up the stairs, and <clears throat> what happens is you know that wasn't my room the whole time, that my my room was on the other side, and the original teacher's room was there for years and years and years. And all of a sudden, you know, um, they, in the middle of the school year, they picked, they said, okay, you got to move to this room over here. And it's a bigger room, a larger room. It overlooks the town of Pahala. You guys want to come take a tour? You guys can come. I'm just kidding. But it, it's, it's the largest room with the most windows. And I'm thinking, man, why am, why am I in here? And the word, you know, not to make things spooky spiritual, but the word 21 has always been a, 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 a number that I, I just love so much because... To me, that's one of the, almost a perfect number because three is the number of the Trinity. Seven is the number of perfection. Seven times three is 21. And I'm like, man, I believe I'm in the perfect will of God. Can someone say amen? 
<clears throat> and as I'm in there, you know, wondering what am I doing on this campus? I said, God, if you placed me, you planted me here, Lord, let me do whatever I can do, whatever you want me to do. And a couple weeks, you know, uh, into uh, uh, the quarter, uh, this new person arrives, you know, this, they hired a, 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 for a new job, and just so happened, you know, he's one of the counselors, and he, he's, his office is right next to my room. Can someone say amen? And this is the same guy that walks across the field and asks me some spiritual questions. And he, was, and, and, and he began to ask, and he actually said, do you do spiritual counseling and whatnot? You never know what God has planned for you. Can someone say amen? You might be right where God has you. <clears throat> and so I'm just thankful for a man of God like Micah. And the word Micah in the Hebrew means who is like Yahweh. I love that. That is a beautiful name, Micah. Names are significant. And I'm like, you know, a, a, a name like that, Micah, is like anytime you, you know, try to backslide or you try to settle for the secondary will, secondary uh, uh, things in this life instead of God's perfect will, you just got to say, Micah, who is like Yahweh? Nothing can compare his plan. Nothing can compare to his plan or his presence. <clears throat> when God called Jeremiah, he laid his hand on him in such a way that there could be no true choice but to hear and obey. It was so pronounced. It was so, so printed on his heart. <clears throat> he, had brought, he had been brought to this hour for this purpose. Yet, so he was brought to this hour for this purpose, yet, of course, he had to choose and he had to obey and continue to do so throughout his ministry. See, <clears throat> in my devotion, I was reading one day in the City, City of Light Church. It says this, each of us has a unique role to fulfill during our time on earth. Can someone say amen? Let me read this again. Each of us has a unique role to fulfill during our time on earth. And we'll find that based on the soul print, the destiny that he stamps on our heart. When you are faithful over what you've been given and the role you've been assigned, you're able to live out the destiny that God has for your life. <clears throat> One way that you and I can ensure that we are heading towards our destiny is this, that we would maximize what God gave us. Can someone say amen? Everybody say maximize. Charles, you won't ever forget this word because your dog's name is Max. So you look at your dog and say, I'm going to maximize everything God has given me. When you live in a world of comparison, you begin to get an improper view of who God is and focus on what others have rather than what God has given you. Isn't that a trap of the enemy, that comparison game? Look at that church, or look at that marriage, or look at this, and, th and then you know, look at that person's car, or that person's job. So what happens is don't be so wrapped up in what God is doing in someone else's life that you miss out on the destiny that he has for your life. Can someone say amen? And I pray that to this morning that I will be able to spark your fire, spark my fire, spark my desire for destiny, for the destiny on your life. Maximize means this, make as large or great as possible. Whatever gift has given you, if your gift is basket weaving, make it as large and great as possible for the glory of God. Can someone say amen? If you don't know your destiny, ask God, God, <clears throat> where do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? With what attitude and character you want me to do it? And just be faithful with that until he reveals something else. Amen? Whether, whether or not we, we've successfully lived out our destiny is determined by how we have utilized our talents and abilities during our time on earth. I love Colossians 3.17. It says this, and whatever you do, everybody say whatever. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, Joseph, no matter where he went, he did everything, <clears throat> whether in word or deed, he did it all in the name of his God. And whether he was in a pit, whether he was sold to slavery, whether he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, or whether he was in prison, he still did everything with excellence. He still used his gifts, and eventually it he got him to his <clears throat> destiny. You see, destiny is similar to the word destination. 
And so if we don't know our destiny, if a person doesn't know where he is headed, I guess any road will do, right? Not in God's kingdom. If we don't know what God destined us for, we won't know if we got there or not. How will I know if I'm going in the right direction if I don't first determine my destination? So what happens is if we don't have our, our, their destiny and an imprint in front of us, when God showed me that I was supposed to be a preacher, it was his blueprint, it was his it was his imprint says, this is the direction that you're going. So I so said, what next, Lord? Okay, leave the military. What next, Lord? Okay, take some Bible courses. But it, it can apply to anything else if he's called you to be a counselor or baker. But are we taking those steps towards our destiny? Because destiny calls out and potential cries out. If there is no des- true destiny, then any path will do. Proverbs 29, 18 says this, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. What does it mean? Where there is no revelation or vision of who we're supposed to be, then anything will do. We just do whatever we want to do because there's not a vision in our lives. Where there is no vision, the New American Standard says, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. Any road, or if I can put this uh, local style, any kind, whatever kind, it, it don't matter, any kind. I, I have no call in my life. I just do whatever I like to do, any kind. But not with God. <clears throat> Paul said, I discipline myself so that after, in 1 Corinthians 9, 20, 26 says this, Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. And so Paul talks about a man who runs aimlessly with no vision, no revelation. And the, uh, the word aimlessly in the Greek means adelos, which means uh, irresolutely or without attending to the prescribed marks or lines. Basically, there's no resolve in our lives to go after anything. And so there's times where I began to doubt my destiny until I realized that I was discontent every time I stopped moving towards it. In closing, I want to share this story. I want to read two verses in closing. And one that we all have already pretty much memorized. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 13 says this. Therefore, remember that formerly, everybody say formerly, You who are Gentiles by birth and call uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. Everybody remember when you were separate from Christ? Excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without a hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen? So we're foreigners, we're aliens, we're excluded, we're without hope, without God, but His blood draws us close to Him. But Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has prepared stuff for you and I to do, and he prepared that in advance. And it says that we are God's handiwork, we are his masterpiece, and we are his workmanship. <clears throat> Heather, can you put up um, um, the, that, uh, that Italian word? I think it's I- imagine del cori. Ima- Im- imagine del cori. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. <clears throat> imagine del cori. And I want to end with this. <clears throat> to the average eye... It was a mutilated piece of marble. The aborted sculpture had been abandoned half a century earlier by Agostino di Duduccio. So here people are looking at this mutilated piece of marble. And the, they, someone, this guy, Agostino di Duduccio, he aborted the sculpture and he abandoned it half a century ago. But a young man, a young artist named Michelangelo saw something in that stone others did not. I pray and there's people that might look at you and they say, you know what, there's nothing in you. God cannot use you. I pray, you know what, don't listen to that lie. People will abandon you. They want to put confidence in you. But how many of you know our confidence comes from the Lord? Can someone say amen? <clears throat> so Augustino di Docio he abandoned the sculpture. But a young artist named Michelangelo saw something in that stone others did not. 
And God sees in you something that man does not. And listen real good that God sees in you that, what some, that, that you didn't even see in yourself. <clears throat> and chiseling the 18-foot block of marble would consume nearly four years of Michelangelo's life. But that seemingly worthless stone was destined to become what many consider the greatest statue ever sculpted by human hands. Can someone say amen? And this is the statue of David, which we're going to talk about later. But Giorgio Vasari, a 16th century artist and author, called it nothing less than a miracle. Michelangelo resurrected a dead stone and breathing his artistry and craft into it brought David into existence. Some people might have thrown you to the side. Some might have been given up in you and seen nothing good in you. And you may not even see anything good in you, but you know what? There's destiny in you. You know why there's destiny in you? Because God is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. Can someone say amen? It is a total lie of the devil to believe less of us than what God thinks of us. Can someone say amen? It's a really slap in God's face to say, God, you cannot use me. It's basically saying, God, you don't have the ability to use me. How many of you know while we were sinners, Christ died for us? Come on, somebody. When we're useless and didn't even have the Spirit of God in us, He still saved us, and He filled us, and He called us. And you know what? He is our present help in times of trouble. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Can someone say amen? And when somebody said, you're finished, guess what? You say, you know what? No, God's not finished yet. Can someone say amen? I can just see in the spirit the devil said, you're finished. America is finished. The church is finished. Your marriage is finished. You're finished. And all you got to say is, no, God is the author and finisher. And he's not finished. Can someone say amen? Don't give up. Keep pressing. Keep going. Can someone say amen? People can abandon you for half a century. But guess what? What God begins, he completes. Can someone say amen? <clears throat> As he chiseled, Michelangelo envisioned what he called the imagine del cure, the image of the heart. Brother Andrew, I don't care what happened in your past. I don't care what happened in your present. I don't care how you see yourself or others sees you or it doesn't really matter. God has an image, an imprint in the spirit realm, how he sees you. And that all, that's all that matters. That's why it says we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. People say so many negative things that get caught in your brain. Come on, somebody. And we got to take captive every thought and make it obedient to how Christ sees me. Can someone say amen? <clears throat> All he had to do, Michelangelo, was to remove the excess stone so David could escape. Let me say that again. All Michelangelo had to do, he had an imaginary del coro. He had an image in his heart on how it should look like. And, and, and he, what he, he had to do was remove the excess stone. You see, God is trying to move stuff out of our lives, but we're trying to hang on. Come on, somebody. But it doesn't match the image del coro. It doesn't, it doesn't match the image of his heart. Can someone say amen? If he's saying let go of pornography, it's for a reason. If he's saying let go of the bottle, it's for a reason. If he's let go of the anger, the lust, the hate, the unforgiveness, it's for a reason. Can someone say amen? Because it doesn't match the image of his heart. Can someone say amen? When we get to heaven, he's not going to say, let me see all the things you've done great. <clears throat> I believe all he's going to do, he's going to put an image of his son, and we're going to stand there, and he goes, like, do you look like my son or not? Can someone say amen? He's not going to care how big your church or how big your bank account. He's just going to look. And I believe that David, the reason why, listen real good, the reason why David was a giant killer, the reason why David was anointed as king, you know what, was he perfect? No, he failed many, many times. But I believe one of the greatest characteristics, because he was faithful to his God. It doesn't matter <clears throat> what kind of job was given to him. He was faithful to it. He didn't care about the limelight. He didn't care <clears throat> about po po politicking. Can someone say amen? His heart's goal is, is in the end, did I please God? That's all, that's all that matters. In the end, did I please God? I would never want to see away from me. I never knew you. Only he who does the will of my Father shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
I, I, I have no luxury to do anything else but the will of God. Can someone say amen? <clears throat> we must finish the race. I believe the reason why David uh, was a man after God's own heart is because, you know what, before he had, the whole nation, Joel, nobody wanted to face Goliath. Everybody was scared. Everybody cowered down. Not even the present king wanted to take on Goliath. But this little, frail kid named David. It's good. Many people had reputation, but they didn't have God inside. Can someone say amen? I could care less about reputation. The main thing that I have God in me. Can someone say amen? And this is one of the reasons why I believe David was a man after God's heart. And David was able to be a giant killer. And David became king. Because God pretty much tested the whole nation. He's going to make, he's going to put an impossible giant in front. And only those who truly had God in them would be willing to take down the giant. And this pandemic and all this stuff are like present day giants. Different decisions we got to make. And I believe, you know, David, <clears throat> David had history with God. David walked with God. But it was time. Nobody wanted to take down the giant. <clears throat> but David, how many rocks did he have? Stones? Where did he get the stones from? He went to the river. I want to say this real quickly. Stay close to the river. Can someone say amen? Stay close to the river. The river of life. The river of God. The river for your life. And David kneeled down <clears throat> in that river. And as he reached down to grab those stones, he had to look in the river. And guess what? He had to look at the reflection of himself. Can someone say amen? It's probably maybe even the first time he actually saw a reflection of himself. And I strongly believe that, you know what? The only way he could have taken on the giant was that he didn't see himself, that he see God in him. Can someone say amen? Because what happens, if I just look at me, I can't do it. But if I look at him, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can someone say amen? The reason why we don't answer a call and death in our life is because we are looking at ourselves. I cannot preach one iota in my own strength. Nobody could take that giant down. But David could. Because it wasn't the size of the giant. It was the size of the God within David. Can someone say amen? And don't believe it for one last minute that God is not dwelling in you. And if you feel he has not baptized you and filled you, ask him to fill you. See, all Michelangelo had to do was remove the excess stone so David could escape. He didn't see what was. He saw what could be, what already lay within his heart. You know, when God looks at us, he doesn't see what was or what is. But what could be? Can someone say amen? He didn't see the imperfections. You may see it. I may see it. But if we're trying to bring our perfections to Christ, how many of you know you're trying to bring your own salvation? Can someone say amen? He didn't see the imperfections in the stone. He saw a masterpiece of unparalleled beauty. And that is precisely how God the artist sees you and I this morning. <clears throat> Justin, are you perfect? No. And you know your pastor, your coach, your basketball nemesis that schools you on the court all the time. I'm just kidding. No, that's a lie. <laughs> he schools me. Man, God doesn't see your imperfections. Does he want us to be transformed in those areas? Yes. Does he want to sanctify us in those areas? Yes. But he sees you who you can be. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, God, God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're reminding us that you're looking down at each and every one of our lives, Lord God. And Lord God, like that abandoned piece of marble that was left untouched for 50 years, God, Michelangelo came along and he saw the completed work before it was completed. We'll take that as a prophetic word. 
That God sees a completed work before it was even completed. If you're in this place and you say, you know, Pastor, man, sometimes I feel like that marble stone, half finished, that people have given up on me and sometimes I give up on myself and sometimes I feel God has been giving up on me. And he said, today, I want God, like that Michelangelo, to pick up his chisel and to begin to work on me to bring me to completion, to fulfill my destiny. If that's you this morning, no one looking around, lift your hands and just wave at me. Anybody in this place? Thank you. Anybody else? <clears throat> Thank you. Anybody else? Heavenly Father, Lord God, for those who raise their hands, Lord God, I ask, Lord Jesus, Lord God, that you complete the work in each and every one of us. God, that you have an imprint in, in, stamped in our souls on who, that image of who we are to be. That we are to be conforming to your image, to be more Christ-like. Lord, I pray, Lord, I want to call for destinies. I want to call for people's potential, Lord God. I want to call for my potential, my destiny, Lord God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we will not run from the fight, but we'll run to the fight. Lord God, the Bible says, can the, pot, the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Lord, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we'll put ourselves back on the potter's wheel. That will allow, Lord God, you to carve our hearts, carve our lives, carve our schedule the way you desire it to be. Lord God, that we will come into the full fruition, Lord God, like that 18-foot statue, well chiseled by a master artist, Michelangelo. And you are even greater, Lord God, than any artist. But Lord God, you gave Michelangelo those, those gifts and talents, Lord God. If you can give the greatest sculptors and artists those types of gifts, imagine, Lord God, God's gift and how He can sculpt us, how He can design us, and how He can make a masterpiece out of each and every one of us. So, Father, we silence the voices, we silence the doubts, and, Lord God, we ask that you pick up, Lord God, your pen, and you write our story, Lord God. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen and amen. Will you give the Lord a hand clap this morning? Amen.